So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be talking about a serial killer. And before we get into it, I just want to give a little bit of a warning, and I've never given a warning like this before, but this case is probably the creepiest I've ever covered on my channel. So not like the scariest, not the most gory, not the most like upsetting, it's just creepy like it sounds like a horror film but today we're going to be covering the serial killer known as the weepy voiced killer and they are called the weepy voiced killer because after every kill that they would do they would call the police and give themselves up they wouldn't give themselves in but they would call the police crying weeping giving where the body was how they killed them and saying sorry for killing and so i will be putting those police phone calls in this video and just a warning they are some of the creepiest things i've ever heard so if you are easily creeped out if you're watching this alone at night with the lights off maybe turn on a light so before i get into it i just want to give my usual disclaimer that i mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that i talk about in this video this is all just information that i have found on the internet and i'm compiling into one video so on new year's eve of 1980 20 year old university student karen potak was out celebrating the new year with her sisters and some friends they were out celebrating in the twin city area of minnesota and if you're not kind of familiar with american geography neither am I but I'm gonna try my best. So the twin cities are two cities that are often kind of categorized together they're often like talked about together as the twin cities even though they are separate cities and these are St Paul and Minneapolis and between the two cities is the Mississippi River. So Karen and her sisters and her friends were all out in the city of St Paul celebrating New Year's like I said. So they were all having a good time Karen stuck around to see midnight but when the club closed at 1am her friends and her sisters noticed that Karen had gone. Karen was seen leaving the club alone just after midnight. She was drunk, she still had a drink in her hand. She was wearing no jacket and it was snowing that night and she just kind of walked out into the road and went off. Although that street that Karen walked out onto was pretty busy, it had people everywhere, it was New Year's Eve, everyone was out. However, Karen eventually found herself on an alleyway alone. The only other person on this alleyway was a man in a car who saw Karen. She was obviously drunk. She was walking around without a jacket on. It was snowing outside, like I said. And so he pulled over and offered her a lift home. And Karen, drunk and cold, wasn't really putting her safety first. And so she just got into the car with this stranger. And then around two hours later at 3 a.m., police received the following phone call. Yes, please, this is an emergency. Please send a squad to Pierce Butler Road, uh, Mollenberg Manufacturing Company, Machine Shop. Please, there's an ambulance, too. There's a girl hurt there. Can you tell me what happened to her? Just hurry, there's a, she's laying on the ground in the back by the, by the railroad tracks, by the air hurry. What, what's the address? I don't know. Who are you? So police rushed to this manufacturing shop where they found Karen Potak on the ground injured and no one else was inside. She'd been left on a bank of snow by a railway and she didn't seem to be moving or responding at all. Karen was naked and severely beaten with a tire iron actually to the point where her skull was cracked open. And unbelievably Karen was still alive and so they rushed her to the hospital, she had emergency surgery and she survived the attack. Even though police didn't really know much about this attack at the time Time, due to the severity and the viciousness of the attack on Karen they actually categorized it as an attempted murder rather than just an assault unfortunately because Karen had been beaten so bad to the head she didn't remember a single thing from her attack which I suppose is fortunate for Karen however this also meant that she didn't remember a single thing about her attacker what he looked like what car he drove anything like that and so finding him was gonna be near enough impossible. The attacker also left nothing in the way of physical evidence at the crime scene, and this was in 1980, so the possibility of getting DNA evidence from the scene wasn't even considered. There were also absolutely no witnesses because this manufacturing shop where she'd been attacked was completely isolated there were no houses around it so no one to hear or see anything police had no suspects no one was arrested and this case went cold very quickly then five months later on june 3rd 1981 police received another disturbing phone call oh, you, you find me i just stabbed somebody with an ice pick i can't stop myself i keep killing somebody hello are you there? 
But this time the caller didn't give police instructions on where they can find the body and so police didn't really know what to do at first. The second call wasn't immediately linked to the first one, obviously it's going to take police a couple of hours to put two and two together and to link the two and to take this second call seriously. And so because of the voice and because of the very kind of out there claims in the call, police just kind of disregarded it as a wind up. That was until a body was found. A few hours after the call was made, a group of teenage boys were walking through a wooded area by an unfinished freeway when they saw a female body laying face down. The body was that of 18 year old Kimberly Compton and just like the caller said, she'd been stabbed with what seemed to have been an ice pick 61 times. She'd also been strangled with a shoelace, however that wasn't her cause of death. Her cause of death was from the blood loss from the stab wounds. Kimberly was from a small town in Wisconsin and she'd just graduated high school and decided that for the next chapter of her life she wanted to move to St Paul in Minnesota. And so that's exactly what she did. She moved to St Paul to start her new life but she was murdered within hours of getting there. So Kimberly got a Greyhound bus to St Paul. When she got there, she bought a locker to put her bags in and then she was a little bit hungry. So she walked outside of the bus station and immediately on the other side of the road is Mickey's diner. So Kimberly went across to this diner, she ordered some food and then sat in a booth alone to eat it. And it was pretty quiet in this diner. There was only a few other people in including another man eating alone at a booth just a few down from Kimberly's. This man noticed Kimberly come in and sit alone eating her food and so he decided to get up and go over and strike up a conversation with her and eat with her. Quickly the two of them got onto the topic of how Kimberly was new to the city and so this man offered to take Kimberly around driving her to all the different sites and Kimberly accepted so the two of them finished their meals and then left the diner together and then just a few hours later was when police received that second call. This time police actually managed to trace the phone call to a payphone by a bar by the diner and the bus station. However, obviously by the time they got there, no one was there. Since Kimberly had left her bags in the locker in the bus station, her body didn't actually have any form of identification on her, and so police couldn't identify her for a while. But eventually when her body was removed and taken for post-mortem, they found a locker key in her pocket so they could go to the bus station, look inside of her bags, and there they found her ID. During her post-mortem, it was found that just hours before her death, Kimberly had eaten beef and fries. And this was huge because Kimberly was very new to St Paul. She'd only been in the city a matter of hours and so no one really recognised her, no one knew her name, so no one was able to piece together her last movements. That was until police realised that the special at Mickey's Diner across from the bus station was barbecue beef and fries on the day of her murder. And so police went into the diner, asked the staff if they recognised Kimberly Compton and they said yes so they could piece together her whole movements before her death. And that's how police learn everything of how this stranger had gotten up to go and speak to Kimberly, they'd gotten talking and eventually left together, making police think that maybe that was her murderer. Once again, the killer left absolutely no physical evidence at the scene, the waitresses at the diner couldn't give any more information than they already had, and so ultimately it seemed as though this case was gonna go cold too. But then two days after Kimberly's murder, police received another phone call. Don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. Don't know why I had this tavern. I am so upset about it. I keep getting drunk every day and I can't believe it. It's like a big dream. I just, I can't think of being locked up. If I get locked up, I'll kill myself. I'd rather kill myself than get locked up. I'll try not to kill anybody else. This time, police decided to release the phone call to the media who could play it on radios and hopefully someone might recognise the voice and come forward. And a lot of people claimed to recognise this voice. Everyone seemed to think that this caller was someone that they knew. And so police were given hundreds of names, they looked into every single one, yet none of them led anywhere. For nine months, both of these cases went completely cold. No new information, no new leads, no new evidence. That was until police got their first suspect. Just two months after the murder of Kimberly Compton in 1981, a man named Alan Lopez murdered his whole family and was sent to a mental facility. For an hour or so after committing the murders, Lopez was in a standoff with police. It wasn't like a violent standoff, there wasn't shooting or anything, but police were just outside the house knowing that he was in there 
but they just kind of had to think of an appropriate way to get in and arrest him since he was obviously a dangerous man. If police would have just stormed straight in, who knows what kind of weapons Alan had in there. I don't actually know how he killed his family. So it could have been guns, it could have been anything. He could have been a very dangerous man. So police were waiting outside, they were waiting for him to calm down, they were formulating a plan. And that was when Lopez shouted out to the police that he was responsible for the murder of Kimberly Compton. So anyway, Alan Lopez was found guilty of the murders of his whole family and he was sent to a mental facility. And police were just kind of waiting for him to settle into his new environment before they were going to go in and question him about Kimberly Compton's murder. But within days of Alan Lopez arriving at the mental facility, he actually committed suicide and police never got a chance to question him about Kimberly's murder. So police knew that whoever was responsible for Kimberly Compton's murder was also responsible for the attack on Karen Potak. Those two were linked by police at this point. Obviously because the victims themselves were very similar, young women, but also because of the calls. That is a very strong link between the two attacks. So even though he was dead and even though police couldn't question him, they still looked into Alan Lopez as being the possible perpetrator of those two attacks. And so at the time when police were looking into this, they thought that Alan Lopez couldn't possibly have committed the first attack on Karen Potak because he was actually in a mental facility that night. But then nine months later, when they began looking back into Alan as a suspect, police looked into some records and found that he'd actually been given a day pass out of the mental facility on the night of her attack. And so now Alan Lopez looked like a pretty strong suspect and so they began looking into his connections or possible connections with Kimberly Compton's murder. But then they looked into Lopez's police records and found that he was actually in jail on the night of Kimberly Compton's murder and so if he couldn't have committed one of them he probably didn't commit both of them. And so now police were right back to square one. They had no suspects, they had no leads, they were just looking at two cold cases once again. But then six months later on August August 6th, 1982, police received a third confessional phone call. Fire emergency. Please don't talk to this person. I'm sorry, I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one. Oh my God. body was found. 40 year old Barbara Simons had been stabbed over a hundred times. Her killer had tried to dispose of her body in the Mississippi River but she'd actually gotten caught in some growth on the side and that was how her body was able to have been recovered. So police managed to trace Barbara's movements on the night of her murder and found that she was actually in a bar that night. Police went to that bar and interviewed all the bar staff, the waitresses, who said they'd seen Barbara dancing and talking to a man all night. At one point close to the end of the night, Barbara went up to a waitress and ordered a drink and she made a comment saying, I hope this man is nice, he's given me a ride home. Staff then witnessed Barbara leaving the bar with this man and because of that comment she'd made to the waitress, that waitress made sure to get a good look at the man. Which is so eerie that Barbara might have predicted things going wrong with this man and so she said that to the waitress to help solve her own murder. So police showed this waitress over a hundred mugshots of possible suspects, all with previous convictions, and she looked through every single one before finally one of the last ones was him. The man in the photo was 38 year old Paul Michael Stefani whose previous conviction was for aggravated assault. Stefani also had a history of mental illness both in himself and in his family which in itself doesn't prove anything, doesn't prove that he's a murderer but when you think about the killings that we're talking about right now the women have been killed and then the murderer is remorseful calls the police begging them to find him, telling them where the bodies are and things that seems like a mentally ill person. It sounds like maybe the person is in two different minds. Maybe they're going through a psychotic episode when they kill the person and then they snap back out of it and suddenly feel remorseful. They also found that a couple of years before the first attack on Karen Potak, Stefani actually used to work at a manufacturing shop named Malberg Manufacturing. That same manufacturing shop where Karen was found attacked and injured. 
So maybe he knew that the area was isolated, knew that there was going to be no witnesses and knew to carry out his attack there. So police put Stefani on 24 hour secret police surveillance just so that they could watch him and then maybe gather some evidence to arrest him. The day after he was put on police surveillance, on August 21st, 1982, Stefani got in his car and drove away and so police followed him. Well, they followed him for a while before they actually lost him. And whether Stefani knew he was being watched by police and lost them intentionally, or whether it was just a coincidence, I don't know. So Stefani drove to Minneapolis Red Light District and picked up 19-year-old prostitute Denise Williams. The two of them made a deal. Denise's rate was normally $100, yet Stefani only had $40 on him. And so they made a deal that he would give her the 40, then they would have sex, and then he would give her the other 60 back at his house. So Denise agreed, they went back to his apartment, he did exactly as he said, and when they'd finished, he offered to drop Denise back at the red light district where he picked her up from. So the two of them got into the car, they began driving back to the red light district, and Denise started noticing that Stefani was taking some unusual turns. Eventually they got onto some roads that were pitch black. It was late at night, it was dark, and there were absolutely no street lights on these roads. And so at this point Denise got a little bit worried, so she asked Stefani which way he was taking her. And he just told her not to worry, he's taking the back streets because it was a shortcut but Denise knew that it wasn't. Denise had actually been a prostitute since she was only 13 years old and so she'd been on these streets long enough to know her way around. She knew the shortcuts, she knew her way back to the red light district, yet this wasn't it. And so Denise began panicking. She's thinking, why is this man lying to me? Why is he taking me elsewhere? Is he gonna try and attack me? What's going on? If he did try and attack her, Denise was a relatively small woman and this was a six foot, 300 pound man. Denise would have no chance. So Denise began looking around the car for anything that she could use as a weapon if this man did try anything on her. And that was when she noticed an empty glass bottle rolling around on the floor of the car. And so she thought if he did try anything, she'd grab this bottle, smash it over his head and then run. Before long, Stefani pulled into a quiet, dark road. It was a dead end, there was no street lights and he stopped the car. And suddenly Denise realized that this was real, that her fears were all becoming real. Stefani turned to his left pulled out a screwdriver and stabbed Denise Williams straight in the stomach with it. And so Denise put her plan into action. She reached down and grabbed this glass bottle and smashed it straight over Stefani's head. Denise had cut right into Stefani's cheek and he began bleeding a lot. He was bleeding all over Denise. Some of his blood even got into Denise's eye and clouded her vision for a while. All she could see was red. Meanwhile, he was still stabbing her in the stomach and she was still hitting him over the head with this bottle. Denise was trying to reach for the car door so that she could get out, but with all the stress of trying to defend herself and being attacked, she just couldn't get this door open quick enough. Eventually, she did get the door open, but she fell out onto the floor and Stefani actually fell out on top of her, all the time still stabbing her. But Stefani hadn't chosen an isolated area to carry out his attack this time. He'd actually chosen a street full of houses. And it was at this point, a man asleep in his house with his windows open, heard the commotion, heard Denise screaming, and ran out to see what was going on. This man's name was Doug Pannin. He ran straight outside and saw a man on top of a woman stabbing her. And he could actually hear the stabbings, like the screwdriver hitting and cracking her bones. And so he was shouting at Stefani. He ran up to him and grabbed him by the shoulders. And when he did, Stefani turned around and lashed out at Doug, trying to stab him as well. So Doug just ran straight back into his house and called the police. Stefani, instead of carrying on his attack on Denise, realised that the police were probably going to be there very soon and so he just jumped straight back in his car and sped away. Denise had been stabbed a total of 15 times, all over her head, face, neck, chest. Stefani had actually punctured her liver and one of her lungs as well. Denise was rushed straight to hospital where she received emergency surgery and she survived. Meanwhile, police received another call. But the fourth call was nothing like the others. No weepy voice, no confessions, no remorse. Just a man asking for medical help. I need an ambulance. Where? 1505 Westminster. 1505? Yes. Westminster, what's the problem? I'm all cut up. I got beat up. What's your apartment number? 208, I bleed. 208, where are you bleeding from? From my arm, my face. Quickly, police put two and two together while Stefani was being treated. A man suspected of murder loses police surveillance and within an hour, 
a woman is attacked. Denise had told the police everything about how she was hitting him with this bottle, cut into his cheek, he had wounds all over his head, she saw them. And so when this same man that lost his police surveillance sought medical attention for such injuries, they knew that he had to be the attacker. Once again, police showed Denise Williams hundreds of mugshots of possible suspects, and once again, she picked out Paul Michael Stefani. So Stefani was arrested and charged with the attempted murder of Denise Williams, but nothing more just yet. They had to collect some evidence to say that he'd done the other ones. So one officer began questioning Stefani, and halfway through, he went and got out the weepy voiced killer case file. And when he did, and when Stefani saw this file, suddenly the energy in the room completely changed. Stefani gave this policeman a look that can't really be described, it's more like he knew kind of look. I don't know how I can explain this look to you, but Stefani then became snappy, he became very agitated. Although the only thing he actually said about the weepy voice killings was, you're not going to pin those on me. Police did however charge him with the murder of 40 year old Barbara Simons, the last one that was committed in Minneapolis. Police Police in Minneapolis were also pretty convinced that he'd committed the other two attacks in St Paul, but it wasn't their place to charge him for those. Because the other two attacks happened in St Paul and not in Minneapolis, the two cities have different jurisdictions and so it would be up to the St Paul police if they charged him for those attacks or not. But we'll get back to those two attacks in St Paul in a minute, right now we're just talking about the murder of Barbara Simons and the attack on Denise Williams. And so police began gathering evidence for his trial and they began with those weepy, remorseful phone calls. Police knew by the things that were said in those phone calls such as how the victims were killed, where to find the bodies, Police knew that it had to be the killer making those calls. There was no other way that the caller would have known those things if they weren't the killer because these bodies hadn't even been found by police yet, they hadn't been reported in the media, only the killer would know these things. And so they got voice experts to come in and listen to both the calls and also some audio recordings of Stefani's just normal police interviews of his normal voice. And the experts said that while these two voices in the calls and in the interviews were remarkably similar, they couldn't conclusively say that they were the same person. During his trial, Stefani's ex-wife, his sister and his neighbour were all brought up onto the stand to listen to these tapes right there in the courtroom and say whether they thought it was Paul or not. And all three of them thought that the voice was that of Paul Stefani. His sister even took the headphones off after listening to the tape and just broke down in tears saying, yep, yeah, that's my brother. So Paul Michael Stefani pled not guilty to the murder of Barbara Simons and also not guilty to the attack on Denise Williams, despite all the evidence that police had against him. But obviously because of how compelling all of this evidence was, Stefani was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to 58 years for both of those attacks. As for the other attacks, the assault of Karen Potak and the murder of Kimberly Compton, like I said, it was up to St Paul police if they want to charge him or not. But they didn't. They didn't see it necessary to charge him because they thought he was guilty. It's not like they thought he wasn't guilty of these two attacks. But they knew that he was already going to be serving 58 years in prison. He probably wasn't going to be out for the rest of his life. And so they knew that this dangerous person that had committed these two attacks was locked away from society. And so they didn't see it necessary to charge him for those two attacks that they knew he was guilty of. They just didn't see it necessary to make it official in the eyes of the law. They said that they didn't quite have enough evidence that he'd committed both of these attacks. And so they could put money and resources and police work into getting that evidence but they said they weren't gonna bother because obviously he's already in prison. And besides, there was no guarantee that they were gonna find incriminating evidence against Stefani for those two attacks. They could be putting money and resources into something that wasn't gonna deliver. Which is sad because I see why they didn't bother. Like I said, they were gonna be putting all this money and all these resources into something that could possibly deliver nothing when they could be putting that money and resources into catching other criminals that are still out on the streets. But at the same time, those two victims don't get any kind of official justice. It's a tricky one. It really is kind of morals versus realistic, efficient running of the justice system. Everyone's going to see it differently. Everyone's going to have a different opinion on how they should have handled that. Then in 1997, 12 years into his prison sentence, Paul Michael Stefani was diagnosed with terminal skin cancer and given less than two years to live. Around the time of this diagnosis, Stefani asked if he could speak to some policemen from St Paul, although he didn't give a reason as to why. So St Paul police went and met up with Stefani in prison where he actually admitted to every single one of his crimes, starting with that first attack on Karen Potak. 
She got in my car and I gave her my dragon pill. I said, the heat will be on in a minute. I said, I had to clean some of the ice off the windshield. He basically told police what they already knew about the attack, but he gave some context, some reason as to why he did it, which I've already spoken about in this video, about how she like left the club and then got in his car and everything. Do you remember where you hit her with the tire and pump? Did you hit her one time, two times? Yeah, it must have been about 30 times, but I mean, I good, good 20 times, I think, I know. Were you swinging it this way, or did you poke her with it? Did you oh, I, didn't, I don't think I poked her with it, I, I remember it did mainly on the forehead, on the cheek, and the jaw, the mouth, and the top of the head. And I think it was only about 10 times, but then I know she, she must really be hurting in that, you know, the steel bar like that. And as Stefani was kind of reliving all of these events, police started to see this vicious murderer once again morph into this remorseful, weepy man that they'd once listened to on the phone. I was even hurt when I went back to the car, there oh, there's going like this, I mean, and that's what I would maybe want to go to the phone. I mean, I really want to help her. What the, I, my mind started clearing up. What are you doing? You had a chance to make another friend that kept yelling at myself. You, you like to make friends. He then confessed to the murder of 18-year-old Kimberly Compton, his second attack but his first murder, that girl that he met in the diner. And then that's when she started telling me where she was from in, in uh, Wisconsin and all that. And I said, well, say, why don't you, uh, I'm not even thinking about her right now. I said, hey, why don't you let me show you around town? I said, yeah, I want to show you something. There's really a nice view over here. I mean, you see the nice river. I think I met somebody who probably has something to tell your parents about them. Uh, but as I walked out of the car, I carried my knife with me. I had every intention to hurt me. We laid down in the grass, and I remember opening up a bra and a uh, bra and everything. I'm just feeling the stuff. And they just started standing there. Killing uh, was a... Seemed to be the thing you were supposed to do. That was part of life. Driving the car was part of life. Eating food was part of life. To me, it seemed like killing was part of life. Until I did it, and then I drove away, and then I looked like the one on first cut of road. What are you doing? And then I, I just couldn't turn myself in. That's why I kept getting on the phone. Will you catch me and stop me, or catch me or something like that? Or... So Stefani had finally confessed to all four of the weepy voiced killer attacks. But he wasn't done there, he actually admitted to a fifth. Actually another murder, making his death toll now three, and officially making him a serial killer. And this murder was actually his second kill, so it happened right between the murders of Kimberly Compton and Barbara Simons. The victim was 33 year old Kathleen Greening, and Stefani's mode of killing was very different this time. On July 21st, 1982, Kathleen and her friend Carol Kellogg were planning on going on a trip away together, and so Carol was gonna come to Kathleen's house that morning and they would set off together. So Carol arrived at Kathleen's house, she knocked on the door, but she got no answer, which was really strange because she knew that Kathleen was gonna be in the house. She was expecting her to go that morning. Carol then noticed that the front door of Kathleen's house was unlocked and so she just let herself in thinking that Kathleen was gonna be inside. Maybe she couldn't hear her knocking. But she walked in and it was silent. And so she started going between all the rooms. She was shouting for Kathleen. She was looking in every single room but there was no sign of her anywhere. That was until she got to the bathroom. Carol noticed that the door was half open and the light was still on inside. And so Carol pushed the door open and that was when she saw her friend Kathleen lying face up in the full bathtub, dead. You say that you both got into the tub? Yes. And you sh you're positive about that? Yes. Because I mean, when I, I remember when I pushed her head underwater, I could see her face. Did you push her in by her? Push her head down, or did you push her in the chest area to, under the water? Or I held her shoulders down. You held her shoulders down? Yeah, that, uh, Both hands then? Yeah. Police at first treated Kathleen's death as suspicious. They looked at her ex husband, they looked at possible suspects and then ultimately just ruled her death as an accident. And nobody ever suspected that this was a weepy voiced killer attack, mainly because there was no phone call, but also because the mode of killing was different. This was just a very out of place killing for him. And so because police had initially treated Kathleen's death as suspicious, they took a lot of evidence from her house, including like photo albums, phone books, everything like that. And so when Stefani admitted to this, they began looking through all the evidence again. And so police looked at a phone book that Kathleen owned at the time of her murder and found a number in there labelled Paul S. 
and this number actually belonged to Stefani at the time. Paul Michael Stefani passed away from terminal skin cancer in his prison cell on June 12th, 1998, aged just 53. And that completes this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one. This has actually been a really highly requested case on my channel, so I hope everyone that requested this case is happy now. It's been requested for a long, long time as well, and the name of the case always intrigued me. I don't know why I never actually like properly looked into it until recently, but Jesus Christ. I do have have one question though before I go. I want to know if you guys think that Stefani was genuinely remorseful for those killings. Do you think he was in a psychotic episode when he committed the murder and then kind of snapped out of it afterwards and then made the phone call? Or do you think he was just always a sick person and that phone call was just him putting on an act and it was all just part of his kind of serial killer persona. I don't know what I think. I don't think he was in a psychotic episode when he committed the attacks because a lot of them were very kind of spontaneous. Like that first one on Karen, that was very opportunistic of him. Like he just saw her walking down the road and thought, right, I'm going to attack that woman. Whereas the murder of Kimberly Compton, he sat and spoke to her for a while. Like, I wonder if he was having psychotic episodes, I wonder when he snapped into that. Do you think he was into it before he even met Kimberly? Or do you think they were having a normal day and then he snapped into it? Or do you think he snapped into it at all? Do you think he's just a very kind of evil person that was just a serial killer the whole time. He never had like switches in his mentality. I don't know. I really don't know what I think and I've been thinking about this for like the past week and it's driving me insane. I don't know what I think about this man at all. But yeah, thank you so so much for watching. If you enjoyed, make sure you leave a big thumbs up because that really helps me out. Subscribe down below if you want to see some more from me because I upload true crime videos all the time. Anyway, yeah, thank you so so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye!